Oh, Assalamu alaikum everyone. I think people will start coming in, um, but we're scheduled to start at 8.30, so I think we should start on time. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, welcome you all to the morning session. I'm Osman Fahim. Uh, online, we should have Dr. Bilal Murad, Dr. Wasif Qureshi, Dr. Mohammed Raza, Dr. Tahir Hussain, and Dr. Naeem Tahir Khali. Uh, here in person, I would like to request Dr. Uh, Umar Godkin, if you could please come on the, on the stage, um, Dr. Asad Patan, and Dr. Bashir Hanif, Dr. Tahir Sahir, Dr. Abdul Hakim was in the room. Dr. Navidullah, Dr. Muhammad Walid, and Dr. Asad Bukti. Uh, so the first case is a uh, live inbox case, and we will get uh, we will get started. Hello, everyone uh, from Memorial Hospital. Uh, we are doing a Tabi case for Pakistan Live meeting. Pakistan Live. 2023, and the, our case is aortic stenosis case, and we will use um, a great wall, Boston wall, and we have a, a very good team here. I'd like to introduce my team first. Uh, I have my fellow with me, Hashim Tuneri, and two nurses, uh, Enis and Sema. Also, we have uh, Özge uh, Özden, who uh, who is doing our cardiac imaging in our center, and he will do. She will do. Um, uh, echo today for us, and we have great team for from anesthesiology department, Gökalp uh, Gündoğdu and uh, Sinan Yıldırım. So, before we start, I'd like to introduce you to the, the case, and Özge will give you uh, some uh, echo uh, information after me. Can I have my slides, please? So, this patient is 75 years old male. He has diabetes, hypertension, and severe coronary artery disease. Actually, the patient came to us for RCA CTO recanalization, but the patient had severe dyspnea and orthopnea at that time. And next, please. And in, in history, patient had um, four vessel cabbage operation in 2001 and 2013. Um, coronary angiography was normal. And two years ago, patient had RCA graft PCI, but after PCI, uh, Safan graft PCI, stent occluded, which is expected, I think, because it's very old uh, graft. And then after that, patient uh, had another uh, graft instant uh, CTO PCI, which is failed. The patient uh, sent to us for native RC CTO uh, recognition. But when we have the patient, pa patient was in uh, almost acute pulmonary edema. Next, please. And then we found that aortic stenosis is very severe and we, we think that the patient's symptoms mostly related to uh, aortic stenosis and the ball is, looks as acunated. So our plan was to treat first aortic stenosis and we will do some uh, work for uh, if we have viable tissue or if we have ischemia and after that we will think about RCA-CTO recognition. And next please. So uh, in terms of um, uh, aortic evaluation, we have uh, aortic valve um, analysis around 26 uh, millimeter, and uh, we have quite good distance from. Uh, 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 in terms of coronary ostium, we have a good distance left uh, from analysis 14.5 and right uh, 24.7 millimeter uh, height. Next, please. This is uh, analysis measurement. We measure uh, array or. Uh, and also perimeter there with next please and uh, this this slash shows us classification distribution which is okay we don't have that much um, very big nodule and and also uh, we don't have a sub sub -annular classification or lvot classification which is good for for us for to reason for uh, for less risk for uh, aortic rupture and less uh, risk for, uh, I think, a parallel leak after implantation. Next, please. This is femoral arteries, uh, quite tortuous, but the smallest 
diameter is 6.3, which is okay. We need 5.5. Um, I don't think it will be a problem for us. We will use 14 sheath for accurate neo tool. Okay, so SG, please give us some infor information regarding uh, echo. Can we have the echo as a big screen, please? Uh, and uh, here I will shortly show you some images. And uh, you can see here the mean gradient is around 45. Vmax is uh, more than 4, 4.3 actually. And the uh, uh, calculator's aerobic valve area is around 0.7, uh, which is indicator of severe aerobic stenosis. And this patient has an ejection fraction of uh, 50% with a, uh, a kinetic inferior basal wall. I'll show it to you again. And the mild uh, marginal regurgitation, no pulmonary hypertension. You can see here the akinetic, almost akinetic inferior basal wall. No pericardial diffusion. So those are the main findings. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Özge. So, um, so you see that it's, uh, I think uh, there's a clear indication for um, uh, type in this patient and um, I inserted uh, to uh, aorta and I also did uh, right side uh, puncture under ultrasound guidance, both left and right. So at the moment we have six French uh, sheath and I'll in increase it uh, to a nine French sheath to have better result with the proglide closure. I believe that if we have a bigger hole, the capture will be better. We have a tortuous um, femoral artery, so we have to be careful. Do you see that how tortuous is it? Okay. So I dilated it, and I will to introduce two probe light. Can you please turn on this screen? This is uh, screen is not showing anymore. I am pushing until we have. Now I have a bit. As you see, I have a bleeding. The first proglide around two o'clock. It's okay. In Zoom, people are not seeing or uh, hearing also. So while we're waiting, Omar, did, uh, were you worried about the tortuosity in that case, and what what wires were you using to support uh, your your access and and sheath insertion? Yes, what we do, um, if you have that kind of tortuosity, we, we most of the time use hydrophilic wire or 35 wire, and then uh, that is a straight one. That they have two type. Uh, soft and straight, straight um, or 35 wire itself uh, straight into the uh, easily uh, diagnostic catheter and after that uh, we change this to very stiff wire like uh, a stiff uplatter. So over that wire we, we were able to insert a sheath, a tabby sheath. Uh, 
it's a 14 French system. The Amplas first if we use Amplas first. First, yes. But it uh, still fire would be fine. Yeah. yeah. So did you have any difficulty getting the 14 French sheath in there in the torture? No, 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 not at all. Because the, the lumen of the artery was okay. Okay. So. And you left the sheath there and you went through the sheath then? Right, yes. Can we have the uh, video, please? I think they're uh, they're working on they're working on the video. Yeah, I have it in my computer. Yeah, can you maybe give it? Yeah. To All right. Let yeah. Let me bring. So maybe we can discuss some basic um, because obviously yeah. um, people sitting here are not that advanced. So what kind of uh, precautions you would take or what would you recommend somebody who is starting new uh, program or would they be doing this kind of uh, if they see tortuosity or any calcifications or anything, would you uh, consider to advise them to do it? I think yes, For especially for elderly patients, we have uh, definitely might have uh, you know, access problem. So, because patients are elderly, most of the time, as you see here, artery is very tortuous because by age, artery becomes uh, elongated, so it becomes tortuous and also very calcified, and lumen also uh, by time getting smaller. So, at the beginning of the uh, TAVI procedures, we, we do have we, we, we did have more complications of access, right? We have really, there are lots of different type of uh, uh, complications, perforations, for example. I think one of the uh, issue when you do TAVI to take care of the access and to do it very safely. In our practice, we still um, use, you know, after, before closing, we always engage uh, the other system contractually and send the wire. We do that always. And some people doesn't do it, but uh, we, we do it because, uh, you know, uh, uh, sometimes we might have a problem and then we have to solve it. So uh, I think number one uh, uh, issue is for me, secure, secure of the access site. This is very important. And another important it's less now stroke yes that's another problem but now we have um, smaller devices than before so i think stroke also uh, not big issue and also uh, study shows us protection re reduced but the so most you, of them are you using cerebral yeah. protection no we don't use in my center i mean in my country we don't have it we don't have any so. and do you use ultrasound uh, to get the access on all your patients for femoral, femoral access, for access? Um, uh, actually, yes. I mean, in our practice, we do use IL, uh, ultrasound uh, for puncture. Um, it's, uh, it's ready in the lab anytime we need, but we don't do it routinely. So, for, for the, uh, what we do, we uh, puncture for the right first, and then 
we do contralateral uh, injection, and then under contralateral injection, we do uh, puncture of the right system. So this case uh, you'd mentioned that was a uh, accurate NEO2, and could you uh, describe a few of the points why you would pick NEO2 over other valves? Yeah, I think, yes, uh, that's a very good question. What I like, uh, after I have accurate NEO2, um, you know, I use more accurate no, uh, accurate well than the others because I have uh, here. For first, I can, I can uh, uh, definitely have less uh, leak. That's for sure. And then, secondly, I have uh, less risk of uh, pacemaker. So I have two uh, big advantage. And then also, uh, it's easier to have uh, coronary alignment with this valve. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's, and also it's, to me, it's user friendly, right? If you, now, if, especially if you know, have a marker, that's give us advantage to place it exactly. So if you, if you uh, place a certain level and then if you keep it uh, in, in place, I don't think you, you might have any problem like uh, embolization. Uh, to LV or uh, aorta, so um, it's to me it's definitely user friendly. And uh, coronary access is okay because the uh, post valve deployment because there's the large there's a larger gap in the frame exactly to access yes, the coronary. Exactly, that's another advantage. We don't have that much you know um, uh, case that we had to do coronary angiogram so far, but I'm sure we have definite advantage of that. And, so and also, risk of uh, to be risk of uh, aortic um, rupture also less if, if you less. use uh, any other uh, stent uh, yeah. balloon expandable one. And what about uh, gradients post procedure? Like you know, for uh, for the evolute, our gradients are very low. We see that for sapien ultra because of the skirt, there's slightly higher mean gradients. Um, for these valves, so what about uh, for NEO2? Uh, are there, is there a significant residual gradient? Is it single digits or is, is it in the, in the teens? In this patient, we have zero uh, uh, gradient and most of the time we don't have a, a grade because as you know, it's also supranular, mm -hmm. supranular valve. So even, uh, if it, even the, the annulus is oval shape or smaller, uh, but Supranular uh, level is larger than other. So I think that's advantage of uh, both uh, evolutes and then, uh, yeah. So I think we have. Especially uh, for the small annulus, I think. We have online uh, panelists. Oh. Just a quick question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open it up to our uh, panelists from the US. Is anybody using a NEO2 and, and where, do, where do you think it fits into your, uh, your current valve options? I think they are probably That's not. I don't think it has been approved yet. Um, I know of selected institutions who are doing it more for research protocol right now, um, but I, it has not been FDA approved yet. So we're using mostly uh, Evolute FX and Sapien, probably 70, 30, 70 percent Evolute. Yeah, we're more, I think, more on 80, 20 Sapien in our program. Yeah, we're probably. I personally probably 80-85% sapien. Uh, NEO uh, is not approved in the U.S. yet, and we're not one of the sites for that. Um, well, for valve and valve, for example, or a really small analyst will still use uh, Evolute. I agree. We're about 90-10 Edwards to Evolute. So, so that's a so, uh, uh, so that's yeah, a good point. I guess so, I'm in the minority here with the Evolute, but. Uh, I'm still of the opinion that uh, with the supraannular and possibly lower gradient, I think at least we've seen good good research experience so far. With uh, the longevity argument is still out there, but I'm hoping that maybe the evolute will uh, the supraannular valves will, will prevail. So that's an interesting point that with the smaller sapien, like a 20 millimeter sapien, uh, and even a 23, but definitely with the 20 millimeter sapien, there's a lot of concern about residual gradients. So does that shift your practice to using um, 
a, a self-expanding valve? Are you cons because the company will say that even though the gradient's higher, you, you, it doesn't translate into any clinical difference. Yes, Usman, uh, we haven't used a 20 sapien in a long time. I think uh, it's available, but I don't remember the last time I used a 20 sapien valve. Yeah, but so in those cases, we definitely go with the FU. So, Usman, so for smaller annulus, we'll, we'll, we'll still, uh, at Heart Hospital, Oklahoma Heart, will still use uh, um, Evolute. Um, and again, you know, even if uh, the annulus is really small, we'll still put in a 23, because it can fit in a 23 in most annulus, uh, uh, even if it sometimes uh, justifies using a 20. Um, so this, the, the smaller analysts uh, with the gradients, I think it does matter at least, that's our practice here. Uh, we have five implant, six implanters, and most of us use uh, most sapiens. Uh, a couple of people use uh, Evolute more. So the um, main reason uh, for using sapien, uh, I've seen like most of you are using more sapien more commonly. Is it just the coronary access, or is it um, any any other reasons uh, you're using more frequently sapien versus uh, evolutor? Yeah, I think uh, I'm sure people have different reasons. I the I think what I appreciate about the sapien, this is the uh, the simplicity and the predictability of the deployment process. Um, I think it's a little bit more, I, won't, I don't want to use the word cumbersome, but there's a lot more manipulation back and forth and recapturing and more movement with the evolute uh, valves. I'm sure the more people use it, the better they get at it. But uh, I have found, at least for the last eight years that we've been doing this, that the, the predictability of, of, a, of a stable deployment in Sapien is extraordinary. Uh, that has certainly been my experience. Interesting to know what the real things. Yeah, I think I agree. The um, the rest of the guys in my team, um, they are definitely more sapien guys because of that simplicity. Um, you know, there is still data out there that the Evolute, for example, is uh, maybe superior or at least comparable to surgically implanted bioprosthetic valves. I think there's data coming out that longevity might be superior uh, on these valves. Of course, time will tell. Uh, but once you get the learning curve out of the way uh, with the Evolute and with each uh, additional, the FX has some markers to help you. And then the future Evolutes are going to have actual openings for the coronary access. So I think uh, things will get easy if you start to do, you know, a lot more Evolutes learning curve dependent. So for, for our institution and specifically for me, so um, part of initial trials. So. A partner trial was done earlier in, in the U.S., so we were part of partner trial, and so we got used to it. When Sertavi came in, we were part of Sertavi, and I was on that too, and we used that too. But it, but if, if you have access to both, and, and I think you used that more in Pakistan because you have access to core valve and it's a little cheaper, um, pound for pound, you can get out, get in and do um, an Edwards valve. If you took 10 Edwards valves, and you took 10 core valves. Um, even in your hand, even if you've done it hundreds and thousands of times, you, there will be several that you will do deploy two or three different times. You will recapture it and stuff. Edwards, you go in, you get done, you're out there. The other part is the coronary access is a very, very definite issue. Um, done lots of these, but there are nightmares that everybody describes of, um, of um, having a core valve in there, and especially the ones before that we, we were really aware of the commissioner alignment and stuff, uh, they're out there and it's, um, there are some cases where we've not been able to access even. They've been brought to me and we've been working on it and stuff and you know did all kinds of crazy things to get in. Um, the data, uh, as far as both of those, there's, there's some data out there that says Edwards is better, but um, registry from Europe, a very, very large uh, registry, several thousand patients, um, actually showed uh, the Edwards were better. I think really they're both the same. They're really both the same. Whatever is is available to you that, that works better. Um, but just just uh, use of um, the use uh, for me is much easier than Edwards. It's you can literally go in and do it in 20, 30 minutes. 
um, as long as you don't have uh, vascular issues and stuff and, and be done with it. I think I agree with uh, the panel here. I think uh, Edwards is more predictable compared to Evolute. And as we plan these patients, the younger patients, you want to be able to plan at least two valve implants over the lifetime. Because if you see, the valve is probably good for about eight to 10 years, surgical versus uh, tower valve. So if we put in an Edwards valve, you always have the ability to go in and put an Evolute valve inside it, or depending on the size, if it's a larger Edwards, you can put another Edwards and then put another Evolute. So I think as we plan on these patients on their future, you have to keep those things in mind because trying to put a valve in valve if you have an evolute becomes very hard, very tricky. And that's why a lot of us will first try to implant an Edwards valve and then think about an evolute valve in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, slight nuances for each valve. There is data to show that with each, uh, as operator experience improves, then your uh, evolute capture, recapture rate numbers do go down with time. And that's kind of been my experience also, but, uh, but Sapien is a very user-friendly device, and, and the ease of cornea access post-valve, I think, is, a, is a kind of a game changer uh, for, for us, uh, for our patients. And it's a very, very good point about lifetime aortic valve management and thinking about the second or third valve. And so as uh, we get more into uh, younger patients and bicuspids, uh, if it's a large analyst, would you send them initially for first uh, tissue valve? Like how, how do you find uh, your surgical colleagues practice changing um, as, as we're doing younger and younger uh, patients with TAVR? It all depends on what the bicuspid valve morphology is and how much calcium is on the valve and whether those leaflets will, will yield to uh, ballooning it. So in our practice, we would like that valve cut out and taken out if there are younger patients and they intolerate surgery and our surgical colleagues are very good at doing that. So we would rather have that valve cut out, taken out and then plan for future valve implants with uh, TAVR valves. I think if your surgical colleagues are actually going to remove the valve, then that's key. Otherwise, you're going to have issues with uh, having a smaller valve area and some potential for patient prosthesis mismatches. So uh, as Wasif was saying, you know, it's key that you have a conversation with the surgeon to, to kind of uh, clear out and get a larger uh, surface area there. Are they doing root enlargements? Like, are your surgical colleagues for these really small analyses doing root enlargements? I find that that's very variable across uh, the experience and results are quite variable. Yeah, they are. They are. We do discuss these things before uh, they take these patients in. So these patients do come to the heart valve meeting and we do discuss these things before they go for their surgical uh, procedures as well. Great. Yeah, so the you know root root enlargement is not a not an easy operation, and a lot of surgeons uh, don't do it very well. Uh, and it, if you so um, there, I was at uh, TV at the London Valve last time, and they were talking about root enlargement. And if they uh, once they pulled and they looked at the surgeons. Um, uh, there are only handful of surgeons in U.S., for example, um, that you can count in, in, in one hand who've done more than 20 root enlargements uh, in lifetime. So, um, so it's not something it's being talked about, but it's not being done as often as we would like it to. And so, then there is a learning curve to that. Um, but it's it's coming around, and there's discussion about uh, you know how the long term. Um, uh, outcomes are going to be. Um, you do get better gradients, but what happens with root enlargement and stuff? I think more and more uh, surgeons will do it and will get better, just like the mitral valve repair thing. Um, if the surgeons don't do it well enough, then most patients will end up having mitral valve replacement instead of repair. So. Great. 
Great. Well, thank you for those uh, comments. We're going to move on to the next part of our morning session, where we have a, a case presentation on a mitral valve and valve procedure from Taba Heart. Assalamu alaikum and uh, good morning to all. I am Dr. Hassan Suhail, an interventional cardiology fellow at the Bahat Institute. And it is an honor to present the first ever valve in valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement in Pakistan done at Art Institute a month or so back. So, this was a 72 years old lady who was hypothyroid and had permanent atrial fibrillation. She had undergone coronary artery bypass grafting with mitral valve repair, uh, replacement in 2014 with a 31 millimeter bioprosthetic bioco valve. She had uh, internal memory graft to the LAD and saphenous venous grafts to the PDA and OMs at the time. She presented to us in September last year with acute heart failure. She'd had previous admissions over the last few months at different hospitals with similar complaints. And uh, the workup there had showed an ejection infection of 60% with a flail leaflet and severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, one of the reports was suggestive of uh, vegetation on the well when she had been treated on the lines of infective endocarditis as well. For the past month or so, she she's started having resting symptoms and would often require two to, two to three liters of oxygen at home to maintain her saturations. The obvious recommendation in this case would be redo MVR and she'd been seen by multiple CV surgeons, but was deemed too high risk to undergo that procedure. Her hemodynamics were borderline. She, her systolic pressures were around 85 to 90 millimeters of mercury, even when she was out of acute heart failure stage, and there was no further room in escalating HFREF medications. In, we performed a CT NGO on her during workup in the hope of finding something we could fix in the coronaries which might help her, sim, help her symptoms and may reduce her heart failure visits, but all her uh, grafts turned out, uh, were, were patent. So in view of refractory symptoms, a high-risk surgical candidate, theoretically speaking, a percutaneous option could be considered. But since there's no availability of equipment, no prior experience in Pakistan, and issues with approval with DRAP, and above all, the immense cost involved would rather lead people not going down that route. I think credit should be given where due. Our executive director, Dr. Bashir, went out of his way to help this patient, as he usually does for his patients. And after untiring effort of, efforts of many months, he secured all the approvals and even got Edwards to give us this valve on compassionate basis. Uh, so we were all geared up uh, to, for this exi exciting adventure, and we had uh, the proctor with, uh, from the Edwards company with us online during the procedure and during pre-procedure pre planning. A tra T was done with a biplane EF of 62%, showing a thickened flail, non-coapting mitral valve leaflet with severe MVAR. The, the annulus size inner edge to inner edge used for sizing in this case was 25 millimeters. She had a hugely dilated LV volume, LA, which was expected with moderate to severe TR, and a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 70, indicating severe pulmonary hypertension. A 29 millimeter sapien S3 valve was deemed appropriate, and which was resulted in a new LVOT of 180 centimeters square, which is above the recommended 170 centimeters square. These are the images of the transthoracic echo, echo showing severe mitral regurgitation. The, the T images also confirm the, confirm the same thing. So we, we took an ultrasound guided right femoral and left femoral venous axis and a right radial axis for hemodynamic monitoring. This picture in the center here shows the, uh, the biocore valve and fluoroscopically only the swing ring can be seen which on the left side uh, is seen, we took a dry on the, uh, before starting the procedure. 
we advanced a Mullins sheath into the right atrium, and then the most important step in the procedure is the site and of the transeptal puncture. As depicted on the diagram on the right, the recommended site is the, the posterior inferior part of the fossa valis. And so under T guidance, we, we using the broken bro needle, we punctured the septum at the recommended site, which gives us about 2.5 to 4 centimeters uh, of height above the mitral annular plane, which is recommended. Uh, uh, we put in an in oil uh, wire into the LA and advanced the steerable agilis sheath uh, into the LA. And through the sheath, under T guidance, we, we, a six French pigtail catheter was advanced into the L, uh, L, LV through the, uh, through the mitral valve. Then two safari wires were placed in, in the uh, uh, left ventricle. The easy disease was taken out, and then we performed the atrial septal dilation with a 14 into 40 millimeters balloon. Multiple dilations were done to ensure uh, adequate passing of, uh, of the delivery system, commander delivery system. So ABM. you used two wires here, two safari wires. One of them is for safety wire? Yes. Yeah, if, if you lose one. Okay. Yeah, usually people do it with one wire, but we, we had two wires in there. The proctor uh, advised us to put in a safety wire. And then what was the balloon size here? Dilatation Sorry. balloon size for septal 14, yes? That's, that balloon size is 14. 14, 14. Uh, that's very important. If, if it is less than 14 yeah. in my practice, it will be very difficult right, to insert. Right, yeah. uh, no, we did actually multiple inflation with 14 and make sure that even inflated balloon can go through we it. We had so. a semi-inflated balloon flossed it over uh, after multiple dilations as well. So a TPM wire was pl placed in the left uh, femoral vein, uh, uh, through the left femoral vein in into the RV for pacing. And uh, the commander delivery system with the valve was taken to the position to position and was inflated. Uh, this is the result after removing the equipment. There was no f significant paravalvic leak. There was a small iatrogenic AST with no significant shunt and did not require any closure. The patient was discharged after 48 hours. She had considerable improvement on her symptoms on follow-up and has started limited activity at her home. She's undergoing aggressive rehab and we expect that her symptoms would improve even further since she was almost bedbound for a year or so previously. And the final T images show a well-deployed valve, good fun function without any significant gradient in the LVOT. And this two chamber view also confirms the, the same thing. I thank you all. Great. Thank you for a, a great presentation and, uh, and congratulations on this wonderful case. So uh, just a few uh, questions. So how, uh, and, and Omar or any of our online panelists can, can answer this, how do you plan for a mitral valve and valve is in terms of valve size. There is a valve app, so mitral valve and valve app, do you use that? Or do you your own CT measurements? How do you uh, pick a valve size? And what are the things that you look at? So I think we should definitely use that app, that app uh, extremely helpful, especially uh, for the aortic valve, because there are lots of uh, different type, and we have a risk for coronary occlusion for, for aortic position. So we have to know exactly what was the first uh, valve, and you know if uh, some of them is very risky for uh, you know uh, coronary occlusion for the aortic position. So we have to know exactly, and of course we have to uh, evaluate by CT. And for the uh, mitral position, mitral position uh, procedure, not that it looks not that difficult, but we might have a problem. We if we if we don't dilate septum properly, first we might, it, it, it will not easy to insert valve, and secondly, we may tear, we might tear the uh, septum. That's another risk. So um, in terms of uh, logic and you know, procedure, it's not that uh, difficult, but we have to know. Uh, I, I think just like Tavar, it's very important pre-procedure evaluation 
and sizing and basically making sure that all those procedures, putting their valve and inflating is not difficult, but all the preparations and making sure the septum is adequately dilated. And one of the most important things is you mentioned about uh, new LVT, LVOT, which they can check on uh, CT prior to the procedure because if it is less than the major risk is LVOT obstruction that could be life-threatening. So you want to make sure that it is good. So luckily we had a, a new LVT was more than uh, 180, which was like uh, pretty good. So yeah. we didn't have any problem with that. We checked the, and you need to make sure that you check the gradients after putting the valve in and we did that and everything was okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I can make a couple of comments. Uh, so I agree with, uh, you know, everything that was said. In this case, you had a mitral valve which was leaking more than stenotic, right, Bashir? Yeah, that's so right. You had, uh, so you had more of a tear. So sometimes a lot of these valves that we are doing here in the U.S. are more stenotic than they're leaking. And crossing these valves can be challenging. Um, so we do use the Agilis sheath, which is a, uh, a sheath you can actually torque. It's one of the EP sheaths. And we, you can cross it with glide wires, straight glide wires, angle glide wires, but it, it, it sometimes becomes challenging just crossing this valve. And especially when you're also coming from the other side, even if you have adequately dilated the septum, it's just the angle at which you're coming into the valve that can be challenging. And then implanting and making sure that the valve is implanted right at the annulus and it's not sitting more in the um, left atrium. And of course, then you're looking at the new LVOT with the CT, making sure that there's enough uh, uh, flow across both sides in the mitral as well as in the aortic section. So especially with stenotic valves, they can be a little challenging to cross and we use agilis sheets, which are more torqueable sheets, which you can use to cross them with. If I could uh, make a comment as well. <clears throat> I mean, kudos to your team, uh, Dr. Hanif. I mean, this is incredible that you were able to uh, take the next leap forward. I think with mitral uh, space, as we do mitral clips and valves and valves, there's definitely, I think, an extra level of planning. The app is incredible. It really helps you understand the size of the valve that's needed. And then, of course, your um, measurement of the 170 to 190 millimeters uh, squared for your uh, neo LBOT using the CT data. You also have to look at the aortic mitral angle, be sure that that's appropriate because then you can run into some difficulties, you know, post-procedure. Um, you know, just like we have Basilica for Tavers, we have the Lampoon for mit mitrals. Um, it's interesting because this particular leaflet was uh, pretty much torn. I mean, we've been doing a lot more mitral clips in the native valves for these prolapse or torn leaflets. I wonder if there's ever going to be any other uh, modification of that procedure to even touch these uh, bioprosthetic valves. I'm not sure about that. That's a whole different space. but. Just kudos to the team. Incredible, impressive case. So, um, so my part is I remember Bashir was in uh, in the U.S. and I was in Pakistan, so he was calling me for for trying to get supplies and stuff. So Bashir really went out of the way to do this for the patients. And actually, while you were there in the U.S., he collected some of the supplies that are not available in Pakistan. So kudos to that's the back end story for Bashir going on. You know, uh, above and beyond for, for the patients. Um, uh, Osman, your question was about uh, pre-procedure planning, and, and that's that's very important. Indeed. These are still not very frequent, um, and so uh, at our institution, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll look at our own measurements. We'll look at the. Uh, I'm not very good at CT myself. I can just read it, but I can't really do a lot of manipulations and so we have a radiologist who works with us, interventional radiologist, and then we uh, lean on the company as quite a bit. So there are proctors there that have done hundreds of these and so we lean on them and then we put all that together and do it. And I'll tell you that there's still times when we had some LVOT um, high gradient. So I had, I had to do some peripheral ablation a couple of different times, despite the fact that the new LVOT uh, did not appear to be um, that significant in pre-procedure planning. There are times when we actually will go to a smaller valve, knowing that they won't be very snug, just to, to make sure that the um, uh, new LVOT is greater than 170, 180. But it, it, it's not as frequent as Taver, and it, it does uh, require a lot of uh, pre-procedure planning. And even when you're putting it in, it's not that simple. Uh, again, the, the um, 
concept legs is uh, important that you, uh, you make sure you're in theater enough and you can go straight into it posteriorly. Is there ever a concern for residual shunt uh, with ballooning or dilating the septum? Or do you have to put in a closure device on the way out ever, or not really? So, uh, you know, um, we will, uh, for most of these procedures, um, if we see a large bi, uh, uh, bi-directional shunt, uh, then we'll do a, a PO2, and if it is significantly lower, then, then we'll go ahead and, and close it. Um, so, so uh, afterward, just look at the, uh, the shunting and see if significant bidirectional shunt is not, and then set the PO2. I think so far we haven't had to close any uh, of the septal uh, uh, ASDs that we created, uh, it's very rare. Uh, usually they will crash pretty quickly if you have a significant, um, you know, shunt that's uh, negatively, uh, you know, it's not favorable for the patient. But you should definitely observe the patient for a little bit, measure the hemodynamics, do some uh, additional pressure measurements, and then make your judgment. I think the key is to take your time when you've completed your either clip or valve and valve to just kind of observe the patient for a little bit. Talk to the anesthesiologist, see how much support you have. Um, we've had a couple of cases where we had to put, you know, bipellas and things like that, but um, it's very rare. It's not that common. I, I agree with you, Thayer. I, I've not put a uh, amplat strip like either or a, a closure device either. Uh, okay. It also depends on the operator. Some of the original operators were a little more aggressive about putting in. Um, closure devices, and as we got more experience, it turns out it's not that big of you, so. So one of the problems that's unique to Pakistan is uh, that there's, a lot of times we don't know what the original surgical valve was. You know, there's, there's no information on the valve type. So are there measurements that you could use to decide your, your valve and valve? Uh, so if you don't know the valve type, do you, what, what are the measurements that you would look at? Bilal, I don't know if you want to take that. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, I would just essentially treat that like a uh, like your native well, um, annular area, right? M measure the perimeter and measure, you, you can at least see the ring and measure the inner diameter of it and try and get a sense of how big it is. Generally speaking, the mitral valves are large enough that it typically does require a, uh, a 29 millimeter uh, sapien. I don't think you would ever put something smaller than that in the mitral position. Um, so I think with the, uh, the mitral has become a little bit easier. I think the aortics are a bit more complicated, uh, uh, like you said, because you also need to understand not just the size of the valve, but also the relationship of the leaflets with the frame, whether they're externally mounted or internally mounted, because that's where the coronary ostium height comes into play and uh, with the risk of coronary obstruction. So uh, I think that perhaps, uh, you know, a combination of TE and CTE guided imaging can help you understand um, and of course, the combination of fluoroscopy, TE, and CT can put all the data together and get an idea about how the aortic root complex actually looks and, and what can you predict ahead of time how the valve is going to sit and, and the risk of coronary obstruction. Usman, uh, I would add uh, a couple of points. I think, you know, initially when we all started towers and uh, mitral space, you know, we had to have good peripheral skills to be structural heart doctors. And then now I think as this uh, field of CT has evolved, most of us are you know, making sure we're doing a CT board. Um, the reason that this may be something to really push on the young uh, fellows that you guys are training is that the CT interpretation and measurements are so vital. Uh, at least on the mitral space, you really wanna measure from the inside edge to the inside edge, not necessarily from the, the frame, but you also wanna take account of the actual leaflet and tissue space. Um, you know, you've got to line these valves in a conical way, not in a parallel way. So you can run into more trouble if you put the wrong valve measurement. So the key is also for those who are going to do structural heart and in Pakistan over time, is to really get them into CT space now. Uh, it, it has changed our understanding of, um, you know, where is the calcium? Is it leaflet calcium or is it annular calcium? Uh, if you know how your measurements, at least in the aortic space, like LBOP versus STJ, et cetera, you really have a better understanding and you can predict um, 
things that may go wrong uh, based on the CT. It can really help you a lot. And so how, would, how do you like to position the valve you know, in, within that original surgical bioprosthetic valve? Where, where do you position your sapien in terms of depth into the LV or into the LA? Uh, so that's a challenge. So it just depends on how um, your, you know, what is your neo LVOT going to look like? Uh, what kind of uh, millimeter squares you're looking at? I think, um, you know, like all these factors play a role. So in the literature, they ask you to look at specific sizing, the aortic mitral angle. There's a certain degree, 105 degrees that you have to look at. And then there's, of course, your uh, cylindrical sphere, like uh, Bashir was mentioning, you guys use your CT to kind of simulate different positions. And I think uh, the other panelists should also chime in on this, but I think you have to be very careful of the angulation when you leave it in there. That's important as well as depth. I, I think shallow depth is, is, is fairly good if you've sized it well. We have a question for, from the audience. Sir, so my question is that, likewise, mitral valve in valve, they have done. Can we do Tavi valve in valve? In the mitral position? Or no, 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 no. Tavi valve in valve. Tavi valve in valve in the aortic position? Yes, sir. Yes. So I think um, you can do it. It's uh, what you have to look at is your corny heights. Uh, for any valve in valve procedure within the aortic position, you have to worry about residual gradients, uh, risk of cornea obstruction, um, and uh, uh, those are the two main factors. So whether it's a, a previous surgical valve or a previous TAVR valve, uh, you have to look at what the previous size was to determine when you put in a new valve what the gradient would be. You don't want to leave the patient with a large gradient because now you have a lot of extra tissue in, in the aortic position. The second is you want to look at the coronary distance from the, from the original valve and, and look at the risk of coronary uh, obstruction. If the distance is more than six millimeters, then generally you're quite safe. If it's less than four millimeters, then there's some increased risk of coronary obstruction if they're, um, I think, uh, women generally have a higher risk of coronary obstruction. But yes, uh, a TAVR valve and valve in the aortic position is certainly possible. And that well would be smaller than the previous one that wasn't? Not, not necessarily. I think it depends on the original valve size and, and uh, what the original valve was. Okay, thank you. Just, just as an aside, uh, 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 TAVR uh, valve and valve, um, the um, uh, core valve is not approved or Evolute is not approved in, in the U.S. to We've done that off label, but generally um, we have to put a Edwards valve in a tower valve. Uh, right, absolutely. Um, and so, so um, I had one more question. So, this on the left side, this is a lower yeah. pressure system. So, is your post procedure anti thrombotic therapy or anti platelet therapy just dual anti platelets, or do you do anything further? Is the risk of thrombosis the same as it is for the aortic position, or do you just use DAPT? So I think a lot of these patients already have mitral, uh, sorry, atrial fibrillation. They may be on uh, NOACs or anticoagulation. So, you know, we would continue whatever they're on. Um, but once you've opened the valve, the flow should be pretty good. So DAPT should be enough for it if they're not on any NOACs or Coumadin. That's a very good question, Asman. Um, this is a slow flow uh, area, and and we watch the gradients very carefully. And um, um, I'm sure Basif and uh, also uh, here, if we increase, if the, we see a little bit of increase in gradient, I have a very low threshold of uh, going to uh, NOAC or or warfarin if they are in depth. But most of these patients, as you know, because of their 
style problem to start with will innate it will be innate fibrillation so there'll be a no edge to start with but if they end up being on tap which is what we do normally if they're not in a fibrillation we watch their gradients very carefully for microstromboli and um and uh and upgrade them to no edge uh, very quickly great should we go on to our live case are, are there live case ready all right, so we're going to go on to our live case. Um, Just uh, one is second, Let's do the live case first. Actually, we're trying to see if we can get the recording from uh, Turkey that uh, live in the inbox, but that's like 20 minutes. So we'll just get this live case and then we'll do that later on. Then the recording, yeah. okay. So we have uh, a tower case from Beria Hospital and we'll go over to them. And I think uh, Dr. Farkad Alamgir and Dr. Naman Nasir I saw were there. Assalamu alaikum, can you hear us over at Beria? Assalamu alaikum, can you hear us at Beria Hospital? So we can't hear you right now. I don't know if you can hear us. Uh, so we can hear you here, and you were just getting the patient ready. We'll be with you in five minutes. Okay, great. So it's do you need you need five minutes before we can get started? So maybe let's uh, in the meantime we can discuss. We have like started, uh, Dr. Omar, maybe I can ask you this minimalist approach. A lot of people are using different approaches, trying to do as um, less as possible. So what we have done few cases is that we do the right femoral and the radial, and then uh, we put a 018 wire in the superficial femoral artery and leave it there, okay? And uh, we do the whole case, and then at the end, if we, we can check, we put a very small forefront sheet through that and check and make sure everything is okay, and then we leave it. And if there is a problem, then we can go from here and do the balloon or this. Uh, uh, have you seen that or anyone else doing any this minimalist approach, or they're all using both femorals? Uh, or using one radial or femoral, what's, uh, what's the common? Uh, I think you are right, that could be a good um, technique, you know, mm -hmm. to, to use radial femoral approach. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it, will, it, it, it won't be safe, you know, if you use only radial and then yeah, femoral, obviously. but if you do two punctuate, Yeah, actually, uh, right they, femoral. now they have like certain places, they have a long balloons. Uh, we don't have it here, but they told me they have long balloon, they can go from the radial, especially if it's the left radial, and they can reach yeah. the femoral. So in case if you need, you, you don't have to have another XZ1. That might help, but if you yeah. need to insert a graft stand, yeah, then, then, then that again, may be a problem. Have to go the other side. Wasif, have you um, seen that being done, or do you have those long balloons or something which you can go from the radial, or you're still doing by femoral? So we, we do bifemoral for the most part. We you do have the we do have the longer balloons. Teruma makes them. Uh, you can go from the radial, uh, and you know other companies are starting to make them as well. But Teruma is one company that has the armamentarium for a lot of these radial procedures for peripheral uh, use. Um, mostly percloses are used for us. So rarely do we have issues to go in balloon things or do things afterwards. It, mostly we reverse the heparin right when we pull the sheet and use the perclose. So it's extremely rare for us to have to go across and around and uh, hold pressure or use balloons to do that. And what about okay, uh, uh, transvenous pacer? Are you, uh, Bilal, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, so yeah, I, I was just saying that I agree entirely. I think nowadays with the meticulous planning, by reviewing the CT ahead of time, knowing what the vasculature looks like, ultrasound guided uh, access, um, and the two percloses, the vascular complication rates are definitely better. 
In our practice, to answer the question, we have definitely moved over to the minimalist approach. With COVID and the bed uh, access problems in our hospital, we had to actually move over. And I started out, what, 18 months ago, the same day discharge protocol. So we moved over to a single radial and single groin access. And uh, we do LV wire pacing now for all our cases. And I found it to be unbelievably predictable. And, uh, you know, I find that the pressure, the, you know, first of all, it reduces one more venous access site and the risk of small risk of occasionally you'll have an RV perforation from a pacemaker as well as not an insignificant problem. Uh, and then, uh, but the early ambulation after four hours and a couple of hours of observation has allowed Hello, us. Hello, everyone. But 40% of our patients actually go home the same day now. So uh, we definitely have moved over to the minimalist approach. Yeah, I would add, um, I'm still yeah. still doing bifembro, uh, but actually have done a few with the SFA also. So you can actually just put a regular six French or five French sheet and SFA also, and then you just uh, uh, perclose it, or you can use angio seal when you come out, and it's okay. I do radials uh, when we have to protect the left main and stuff. I don't deliberately go to radials too much uh, because it just adds uh, a few more minutes to time and and it's probably my fault, but, but basically going to two by two femur is quicker for me than, than actually having the arm on the side and radial and stuff. So and I would echo some of those comments as well. Um, the only thing about radials is that if you do your pre tavar cast through the radial, you kind of know if it's going to be okay in terms of the tortuosity of your nominate. So that's important to know before you go in because on the day of tavar, you're going to struggle. The second thing is don't do radial unless you have the long balloons, the long equipment, the long sheath. Again, Terumo is excellent in what they make. The groins are easier to control. You're right there. You're going to have to put the femoral line anyways. Uh, we've been doing it in the cath lab with uh, moderate sedation for years. We've moved out of the hybrid room. We use the LP pacing wire. That's a good, simple, simple technique. So I think, you know, um, do the radial in some cases if you feel that you have the equipment and there's no tortuosity. Omar, you had a comment. So, you know, if something happened, uh, you know, it could happen. So, for example, imagine that you are doing high, you, you did a high puncture, okay, and you have a bad uh, leak from the femoral artery, okay, high. So, and you have a, a radial approach, and then you might have a bad spasm, and you could send anything from radial. And in that case, you have to puncture again, and then I don't think it's safe on the radial, right, um, radial and the femoral. You should definitely put another. Uh, yeah, no, we are doing four French, five French sheets. Yeah, whenever same. we do radio, Otherwise, we do that. We leave the it wire. It could happen once, but you, you, yeah, you may agree. lose your patience. It may not happen, yeah. but it could. So, yeah, just rem you just remember the covered stents, no covered stents are 150 centimeter long. So, if you're going through radial, you're not going to be able to get a covered stent uh, there unless it's a short part. Right. Regarding crossing the valve, uh, we, I have balloons which are which we can get there easily, uh, but no covered stents are available in long cap. Yes. So let's discuss how can we cross the valve, right? So they are trying to cross the valve. Sometimes it really takes time. We should know that. Yeah. We should we shouldn't lose our patience. It takes time. It takes. It may take 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes sometimes. So we should know that. Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes difficult. So in, in Pakistan, Bashir, which, which wire do you use to, to cross uh, valve? We use the straight wire. Yes. Just the straight um, wire, yeah. Uh, uh, either glide straight or the regular straight. Uh, yeah, but in, we use AL most of the time. We have a straight uh, wire as well in Turkey, but uh, it's not good quality, to be honest with you. It's easily king. I don't mm. know your, your, yours, but mm. in Turkey we have easily king and then we have a problem. Uh, after two, three minutes, uh, there is a restriction between diagnostic catheter and the wire. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, the, in that case, I use always uh, not diagnostic, but guiding uh, LA. So then I have a more space between uh, lumen and the, uh, you know, uh, into lumen, so I can easily uh, push and uh, pull my wire. So if so which, like you're saying, using guiding catheter guiding instead of catheter. diagnostic catheter? Yeah, guiding oh, catheter. Oh, okay. So, so I you, have a more simple... So you have an AL guiding catheter. Yes. Oh, okay. And of course, I, I'm using Y-connector. Uh-huh. 
Okay. So I suggest you, if if your wine is not that good, like 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 us, <laughs> so it gives you more space to push and pull. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So how many operators are doing routine uh, pre-procedure coronary angiography versus using the diverse CT to look at the coronaries? And are you, uh, if a PCI is required, are you doing it at the same time as TAVR or, or giving 30 days uh, between the PCI and a, and a subsequent TAVR? Yeah, a lot of time these patients do have coronary calcifications and you may not get a clear picture from uh, CTA itself. So we end up doing, if, if I, there's no coronary calcification and CT shows normal or really small disease, I wouldn't do it, but if the, the CT is not clear enough, I would go ahead and do it, just at least know what's going on. And uh, These days, the threshold's quite high for PCI pre-TAVR, so if you can rule out left main disease or, or prox vessel disease, yeah. uh, even if there's calcification, you, you, it might be just safe to go ahead and do the procedure. Especially with, that, uh, with Evolute, you don't have to do a lot of rapid pacing. Uh, especially if you're not doing a BAV, so, you know, there's, uh, typically there's not a lot of um, ischemic stress on the patient for a routine uh, Evolute. So what do you do, Dr. Omar? Yes, ma pre he's, he's asking, would you do the angioplasty and coronary angio before the TAVR? Yeah, yeah, I fully agree with you. CT angio rarely uh, make us happy if, if, if it is, uh, the coronaries are clean. Rarely, if we have, if we see that okay, coronaries are good and we are happy, we don't do angiogram. But most of the time, because of the classification, we were not, uh, we, we are not sure. So we, we, we do angiogram before before the TAVI operation, not the same time. Mm, okay. Before and and each procedure, I don't know how long you wait. Um, after CT, after angio, we, we at least we wait ten days. Right for for. Risk of contrast yes, property. Yes, ten days, and I don't think three, four days is enough. I don't know your practice. So you do coronary angiogram before, not at the same time when you're doing no. TAVI. No, we no, always we do, we, some space. we do mostly at the same time. Yeah. What do you do, Usman? Or uh, we're starting to move to more towards same time. Yeah. Because a lot of the our patient... cost issue also comes into play. We have to put another thirty thousand, forty thousand yeah. cost. What about uh, our panelist uh, like? Uh, Naim or Wasif or what do you do? You know, we're, we're, all, we're all people of habit. So when we started doing this, it was about, you know, very early on. So we had people coming in from several hundred miles. So we developed a valve clinic. The valve clinic was they come in the morning and they get everything done the same day. Uh, that includes the CT scan, the PFT, the frailty test, um, see the cardiologist, the cardiothoracic surgeon. You remember initially with the, the, the trials, there were two cardiothoracic surgeons that we see. We do the angiogram the same day, and at that point, um, by the by the afternoon, we would have done everything in the patient go away. So that's been going on for about 14, 15 years, and we've discontinued that because it's just like a clockwork. They come in, everybody knows they're already pre-set up, and then there's no ambiguity as to what we're going to do. So. Um, that's the valve clinic day, and we're done. I think there is a very good debate about should we really be doing um, angioplasty beforehand or not, because a lot of patients, unless you're talking about a very proximal LAD or a very, very critical stenosis, they actually get better with after you uh, put the valve in, even if you don't take care of that, um, that region. The counterpoint is if you're going to put a, a Evolute valve, uh, it's not, it may or may not be that easy to get into the, the, the coronary artery. So maybe fix it beforehand. So lots of discussion going on uh, currently uh, okay. about uh, about the, uh, yeah, there's actually a trial that we're part of uh, that, that's actually looking into uh, either doing pre-angioplasty or not in lesions and seeing how that works yeah. up. So Bashir, we don't, typically do uh, routine angiography. If the CAT scan does not show us any lesions that are significant, we don't. If patient is not having chest pain, we don't do routine angiography. Um, we only do it in patients who are, either the CAT scan is showing that severe disease or so enough calcium that there's no resolution from it to decide what's going on. 
Um, and we always do it before. We never do it the same day of the procedure. And if we do stent them, we do wait two weeks before we will bring them back and put the tower valve in. Now, back in the day, we've done towers on people with critical left veins, prox LEDs, critical three vessel disease who were not candidates for bypass or for percutaneous intervention, and they all did fine. I don't remember losing a patient on the table to pacing on during a tower implant based just because of coronary artery disease. So is it, so because, is it because you're using Sapien or uh, if you're using Evolutar, does it matter whether you would do it uh, or not? Yeah, I think Evolute, as uh, Naeem said, was because if, if you can, it's the reaccessing the coronaries is the, is the main issue. Yeah. And if you can reaccess the coronaries safely, it's better with the Sapien valve than is it with the Evolute. And therefore, if you have a smaller annulus and there is disease and you can do it and it's amenable to PCI, then do it before the procedure. Okay. Bilal, what are your thoughts on, on pre-procedure? No, I, I, I agree, you know, pretty much the same. Um, you know, CT uh, is the default. If, uh, uh, like Omar as well said, that if there is calcification, particularly in the left main proximality, uh, then we'll do an invasive angiogram and try and minimize uh, invasive angiography. Otherwise, if somebody comes in with angina, I think it becomes more critical. But like you said, Osman, the threshold for intervention is so high that, uh, and I think that TAVR is a is a, a safer procedure than complex PCI. Is. It's very well tolerated, even in patients with severe uh, coronary disease, unless you have like severe LV dysfunction and critical left main. Um, I think doing it at the same time is probably a bad idea because what part of the issue is you can't reverse anticoagulation, so then your vascular complication rates also increase because you can't get protamine and then you're left with a 14 or 16 French sheet uh, to manage unless you're doing a surgical closure. So I think our rates of pre tower intervention are probably well under 5%. Uh, and generally, we like to wait for about 30 days. You, I, we have found that there's so much clinical improvement in these patients you know, after a tower that it's, there's really, there doesn't seem to be much urgency, unless, of course, they have left main or, or proximality disease. Yeah, the flip side One of that also is... Would, sorry, go ahead, uh, um, The only thing I would add is, like, you know, in the, in the era of now, CTFFR is, is starting to progress uh, in terms of the software and the duration it takes to get you an FFR. So I wonder if, in, the, in this world of structural heart, we should be looking into CTFFR more. I mean, it's a technology and cost issue, but that might help us determine where you go. Having the angiogram before the TAVR gives you three or four advantages. You've already been in there. You've crossed the valve. You understand exactly what coronary you're dealing with. Um, if, if you can do, actually do an FFR if you need to, or I mean, actually I would do an IFR, not an FFR. But in this particular instance, you know, you have four weeks to get your TAVRs done. You've, you don't want to delay your tower for too long because of the angiogram, CT, and everything. The protocol should probably be do the CT first, then think about what kind of coronary disease history the patient has, deal with anything that requires hysterectomy or complex bifurcation stuff that you can't do right before the tower. But majority of the lesions we're actually deferring now because we're more experienced. In the initial phases, we used to stent a lot. And as uh, you know, Naeem had said too, once you relieve the AS, I mean, you've got much better diastolic coronary flow. You know, I'd, I'd tell you one more thing about the advantage of doing an angiogram. And again, as I said, what we do is it's not necessarily the best way of doing it. We've just been doing it and, and that way, I mean, we would do even carotid ultrasounds that day also. So everything is done then, unless so, there's a patient so we'll, elevated. So we we'll go over uh, to the, our... Uh, when, we, when we look at the CTA, um, sometimes uh, the calcification looks a lot worse and, and we're looking at the alternative access. If you just put 15 cc's in, uh, in, uh, in the distal aorta, you can actually look at the arteries much better. And there's been many, many instances over the years where the CAT scan says absolutely not. And we've gone through and done it completely easily because you did an AFR and we're just used to seeing AFR and there's something to it that is somewhat better than, than just the CT scan. So we'll go over to our live case now. Uh, Dr. Fakad and Dr. Rahman Nasir, Ali, can you guys hear us? Barry Hospital, can no, no, you guys? No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you have to unmute your address, Dr. Vikram. I'll give you instructions. Uh, so can you guys hear us there? Can you? Fresh? 
So yes, we can Just we can hear you. Can you tell us about the case and what? Can you hear? Hi, Osman. Can you hear us? We can hear you. We can hear you, Ali. We can hear us. So we actually we can't hear you much. That that's probably the reason. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about the case? Are you? Can you please? Sure. So uh, Norman, we'll hand over to Norman to introduce and then go over the case a little bit. We've got a bit of an issue to cross the valve, so that always happens in the live case. I and think, some presentation so last minute. Yeah. So, so we're all ready to go. We're measuring the gradients right now. But uh, so we have, this is our start. Can we show Dr. Pakad Alamgir with us, with us uh, over here? He's going to be, we both are going to be working on the case. Dr. Ali will be the director of the show and will be communicating with you during uh, the case. And Dr. Zishan Ross is... Uh, the consultant with us here, Akhtar, <coughs> Dr. Sale is consultant with us here, Daud and the uh, Medtronic team over there. So these are all our cath lab team and Shazad over here. Can you show all of them? Are with the so, so far, where we are, are that we have, um, you know, gotten uh, access, temporary wire in place. We've crossed the valve, measuring the gradients, if you can show the gradients over there. And, so uh, it looked like there was some difficulty. Can you? There was some difficulty can you, crossing the Can you the tell valve, us so. about the history and first what evaluation and everything? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, Nishan, can you go over the history quickly? Yes. So can you hear me, sir? No. Yeah. Uh, can someone put up the slides, please? Because we've got the slides. Yeah. We could see the CT scan and things in the, on the orbit. So if they can put up the slides, please. Or slide to show on. The slides are on. The slides are on. The slides are on. चलिए वरना वैसे बता देते हैं टाइम के लिए इसी से 60 अच्छा सीटी की हिस्ट्री वैसे बता दो ना अच्छा कैन यू हियर मी सर वी कैन हियर यू यस यस थैंक यू सो वी हैव अ पेशेंट शफीक अहमद ही इज 60 इयर्स मेल हाइपरटेंसिव नॉन डायबेटिक ही वाज एक्स स्मोकर एंड 80 केजीज ऑफ वेट ही प्रेजेंटेड टू अस विद सीवियर शॉर्टनेस ऑफ ब्रेथ और माइल्ड एग्जर्शन ECG was uh, unremarkable except having T wave inversions in V5, V6. Uh, echo showed uh, heavily calcified aortic valve with valve area of 0.9 cm square and dimensionless index of 0.21. Uh, echo also showed concentric LVH and ejection fraction was pretty good, it was 60%. The important thing in the history is patient has a single kidney. He had left nephrectomy done previously. And he has only right kidney with multiple large cysts. I will show you the uh, images after this slide. Hemoglobin is 12.2, count is 238, and creatinine is 2.5. His previous creatinine was 1.9. Uh, and urea is uh, 61. Next slide, can you go with me? This is the ECG which is unremarkable except. Mm. Having TV wave inversions in later we are We are not seeing Next your slides time. or ECG no, or anything. Know, no. I don't know if that you is, wanted to yeah. show us uh, something okay. from there because you'll need to see that screen, uh, also the pre op evaluation. They're up here on the stage, but you can't see them on, the, can you, on your monitor. So, can you see our floral screen and can you see us now? Yeah, we can yeah, see yeah, you okay, on your some screen. other screen. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. we are at the stage that, uh, you know, uh, we are about to balloon the valve, you've crossed it, and uh, uh, so take the gradients. So the reason for going Taver versus Saver was the single kidney and the chronic kidney so disease. And in the 60s, a uh, solitary kidney advanced COPD, he was a heart team approach meeting, and he was declined by a cardiac surgical team. Okay. So uh, if I ask, like, uh, Dr. Omar, maybe uh, creatinine or creatinine clearance, what is your cutoff? Um, obviously, um, you have to be careful in using the dye as less as possible, but is there any cutoff where you would say, okay, I'll wait or wouldn't do because it's going to make him worse in terms of kidney function by using all the dye? Because obviously, you have to do the CT scan in these patients using another 70 cc, then if you do coronary angio or then during the valve itself, so obviously he will be at risk of going into okay. acute kidney injury. Yeah, that's very, that's very important point. That's why we are waiting at least five days for each procedure because sometimes if you do the same time, angiogram and the tabi, yeah. so you, you have to give more contrast, obviously. That, that's very important. And some, uh, most of the time, patient has high creatinine because so, so, aortic stenosis is also, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, so affected we, we haven't but, uh, kidney function. Uh, and after tugging, 
the first two later, yeah, yeah. we see that most of the time. Yeah, because his creatinine was mm -hmm. 1.5 and went up to 2.5. Yeah. So I don't know when, what was the duration. Numan, uh, you mentioned that creatinine mm -hmm. went up from 1.5 to 2.5. Did it, this happen after the CT or did you wait in between? It's been, or... it's been stable in, uh, between the range of uh, 2.1 to 2.5 and nephrology saw, saw him, they played him. It was an acute renal failure. And we had CT and Judon also. So when is the and last contrast? Down after end, actually. So when was the last contrast given to him? Last so contrast, yeah. like a week, more than 10 days ago. Yeah. More than? More than, sorry, I didn't say that again. More than? Last oh. contrast was more than 10 days ago and his tracking is back to his baseline. 20 so, days, huh? So what is it now? I thought you said 2.5. 2.1. 2.1. 2.1, but 2. you said 2. the baseline was 1.5. 1.9. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay. That's okay. We have to be very careful. Yeah, that's okay. Saying that it's been, I checked the values recently, it's attaining one, or it's always around two range. So there are low contrast CT protocols, but I find yeah, that the yeah. imaging is not that good, and a lot of times you you have difficulty yeah, measuring yeah. your angle. Yeah. So, um, in fact, you guys, so. Did a viral play to be crossing with a good balloon? Pacemaker, check. So, so while we're working, I will let you know this. That, uh, so, we are, it's a bicuspid valve. And uh, so, I, I, we, I tend to pre I think Omar can and everyone can comment on that as well, that the pre we always pre the bicuspid in our cases, and majority of our cases are bicuspid in any ways. So, yeah, it's one long. So, can you show us the CT evaluation? Can you show us the CT? Or? 130. They're doing the BAV, so... <laughs> Sorry? Did yeah. you do yeah. pacing? Uh, and, uh, Down, how, pacing how off. Pacing off. Yeah, they are pacing take the off, but we can't see the uh, hemodynamics. We can't see the hemodynamic screen. Is no, but we should see the CT at least. Can you see the CT evaluation? Can you tell us the CT, what the axis is like? Uh, uh, you know, I know yeah, you're yeah, sure, with sure. the BAV. So, Ali, can you go with the BAV? So, I, I will, while they're working, I will, I will do the talking a little bit. So, our, for this case, what we decided that we'll take uh, both the femoral axes uh, and then we will we will uh, do the uh, first uh, six uh, micro puncture as usual, six front sheet and then nine front sheet with two pro glides deployed in already. Ali, uh, Ali uh, sorry to say, but I want to look at the CT. What was the CT parameters? Yeah, sure, sure. We have we the slides, slides again. Because you see, uh, we need to tell here that the most important thing is pre-procedure evaluation. So that's exactly. what we need to discuss yeah, before we jump on to the procedure. <laughs> Probably we are in the flow of the procedure, so that's why we, are, we, we didn't go into that. So we're going to put the CT scans for you guys now, so you will see the values and things on that. So... So, um, uh, over there in the U.S., are you guys using low contrast CT protocols? So, go down, next slide, go to the next slide, they keep going forward, so then... Next slide. Next one. Abdominal images of solitary. Next one. Yeah, so, so this is the CT measurement. So, you, can you guys see the CT measurements? We can, but they're very blurry, so, but we can see the screen. Uh, can you guys, is, is it readable to you guys or not? There it is. It's much better. It's up on the main screen now. Okay. So, so if you see the, so there's a good discussion point in this as well. So if you see the perimeter derived from this patient, uh, it comes out around 84. It's cool. And uh, whereas if you see the estimated orifice area, that's a different one. So and then, then I want to, first you guys have a look at this and then, let me know which valves you guys will deploy in because we have already pre decided about the valve, but we will, we will like to hear your opinion as well. So let me know if you, if you want me to scroll down and see because the, it's, it's, the rest of the things are okay. The coronary heights are fine, the femoral axis are okay. It's just the measurements for the bicuspid valve. Right. So can you show us the, the valve uh, images on CT if you scroll down? Yeah. Uh, can you guys scroll down a bit, please? It's the next, uh, next slide. It's the next slide. Yeah, it should be the next slide. So why there are no uh, right femoral or left femoral uh, numbers? Uh, what was it? It was. Uh, 
So it was done with low contrast because of the renal insufficiency, but they have images of the uh, uh, vascular as well for the limited contrast. So they haven't given exact numbers. But so, both, because yeah. it's a company, this one is that comes from the Medtronic, so they don't want to take the rest. So we did our own measurements and we decided that, okay, fine, the, the femorals are fine, so uh, we will go ahead with this. Because we, we did this one with a low contrast and with a single shock phase. So uh, that, because of his kidney function, so... I mean, you see the cysts on the kidneys there. If you want, if you want to see on the right side, you can see those. Can you show us the measurement slide again? So, you know, we can point yeah, out yeah. that the coronary heights are good. The STJ height is pretty good. Yeah. Um, and then your, uh, for these bicuspids, you want to make sure that the aorta size you Next look slide. at, because if they're enlarged above 4.5 millimeters, that's an indication surgically to fix the aortic root also. So what kind of bicuspid was it? Is what, zero, one? So here you go. So, yeah. Looks like zero. Mm. So these are like, the images like there for zero. you guys. So, yeah. so there's some uh, leaflet calcium and commissural calcium, but not a lot. There's no calcium yeah. at the annulus, um, and there's a little bit of calcium as the STJ. Exactly. So the leaflet calcium is there. It's not mm -hmm. that bad because yeah. that's one of the poor, bad signs having calcium in the leaflets. Yeah. So that's, 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 uh, I don't know if it's zero to me, but uh, I don't know. So, Dr. Mar, uh, how like do you size thing. the bicuspid valve? Are you taking the annular or supraannular? So, or take to the next one. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so this is the point in this. If you can annular, to call it the to derive, the next one, please. Then you can, you can see in the next one. So it comes around 34, whereas the estimated orifice area, and because this is the company CT, again, I measured it as well. So it comes around in 29. Next one, CT. <coughs> Next one. And so most of the time... So there you go. So that, that's, the, that's the other measurements for you guys. If you guys see the, uh, this um, office area, estimated office area for the back of the in my In my experience, I would love to hear from you guys, is this that... The, the bicuspid usually never open circular. So for me, I combine both the endless sizes and the measurements with it. So we decided to go with 29, but what would you guys say? So, so um, Ali, um, so you look at the intercommissional uh, distance and annular size, or what is your uh, uh, the sizing? Uh, I'll go with... So for bicuspid, I look at two things actually, or rather three things. I look at the annular diameter, annular size, obviously the parameter derived, and I, I, then I look at the right bottom of that screen. If you guys see the orifice area, estimated orifice area, like because we predict that this is how the valve will open up. So that's so combining these two measurements, where, and usually for the bicuspids, I don't tend to oversize. I tend to undersize usually. For tricuspids, I tend to oversize. So uh, the estimated orifice area, intercommissural, and the perimeter derived, all three combined, and then look at the height of the patient and everything as well. And what what size balloon did you use for predilatation? So I use the 20 millimeter. I, I, I'm always a bit conservative again because of the uh, stroke risks and things as well. I could have used 20 millimeter as well, but because the calcium wasn't that much, and I thought it will be okay with a 20 millimeter balloon. So what did you base on, I'm sorry, um, like balloon size, what was your basis so for using that minimum, size? So I, I go with the minimum diameter of the, uh, 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 whatever is the diameter uh, in the short axis and not in the long axis, but actually it's a combination of different things. I, I, I tend to lower size. My premium is always between 20 to 22 or even lower if it's a smaller size. So I look at the short axis of uh, that diameter and then according to that. Can you go check? If you guys Omar, how do you how do you size in a in a BAV? How do you size uh, in a bicuspid valve? How do you size your balloons? Change that. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know it's, it, it depends how calcification we have. If it, if we don't have that much calcification, we don't go that much. Uh, so are we done with the discussion uh, for pre-procedure pre planning, but or uh, should we? Definitely under size. Now? Like uh, so we're going to go live, uh, two, three, four millimeter uh, under size. Minimal so. annulus diameter, or what's the, any any parameter to look at? STJ junction, or just uh, we, we look uh, sinus valve salva. Mm -hmm. And also, can we take uh, 
average. I think we'll uh, minimum. So we have discussion regarding. You must for the balloon or. So uh, uh, where yes, we are with the procedure the balloon, right now. Balloon. Yeah. So, so, uh, so now, now we're ready to, if you see, we did the, we did the how, how we might have missed that, but to have we grew up with a commercial with the three, uh, three yeah, flush for, and maybe it's still at three o'clock. And then you can see probably the top hat Ali. at the outer curvature of so the Ali, area. Ali, are you using the commercial alignment uh, to do that, uh, keeping the port, flush port at three o'clock, or do you believe yes. in that, or? Exactly. So if you sort of look at the, if you see the, I don't know if you can see the top hat, it's at the outer curve, the yeah. flush port is at 3 o'clock, and we think that will be okay with it. So as we cross it, we go, are going in the AP view, and then we will go into our three curves view, uh, which for the patient is quite different as well, and, and the two curves view as well. So if you see, we haven't taken any injection so far, so we haven't given any contrast so far. Yeah, you'll you'll have to make sure your uh, pigtail is in the non-coronary cusp. Uh, yes, we just put it into the non-coronary cusp. Yeah. And sometimes moved. you can put in two pigtails in different cusps, and that minimizes your need for contrast injection. Yeah. That'll help guide right. your valve position. Yeah. Also. So I, I guess yeah. So and sometimes if if, if you have got the calcium markers as well, some the, that can help you, but probably not in this case that much. So, right. so we're ready to cross the valve, and we're going to cross the valve now and. So, so this so, is. So let's go to the three cusp view as well. We, we cut our contrast 50 50 for injections. Is that what you're doing at the bar? Or your back. Yeah. Back. So, so we, we're going to do that. Yes, Dr. Tyson. We will do that once we do a bit of a crossing of this, and then we will adjust according to that, as you said, definitely. So, we're going to the straight to the. Uh, RO26 and Cordal 17. So that's our near two cusp view which we have calculated. So we are ready to cross it now. And so if you see the top part is facing forward to us, pretty much on so the front of the screen. So that shows that again, probably you will be in commissurally line with it. So this is even with our valve. So because that's the only valve which we have got available with us. Uh, you guys, uh, just to let you guys know, we don't have the so, uh, outer skirt for the valve. So, Ali, with bicuspid, obviously you can't do that cusp overlap view. So, what view you are yes. using to do uh, this? So, so I do a near two cusp. I still go with the near two cusp views. I calculate that and go according to that. And then uh, sometimes I check it in the three cusp view. So, if you see, I think we, we might have to pull back a little bit because the height, it's, it's still a bit low. And we can take a small injection here of a 5cc, probably a handheld one. So we will just see the depth of it and we can... So you start at the lower end at the mid of that pigtail. So I, I, I've, got, I, I think I've got a completely off the book of the uh, technique which I do with it. And I look at two things. I look at the lower end of the nose cone, this is probably the middle of the nose cone where the sheath is, and also the middle of the pigtail, the, the top hat marker. So do both things. So I, I look at the both of it. There is a bit of a parallax still, so we can come a little bit caudal, a little bit more probably, just to. So, so yeah. good for a starting position, and uh, yeah. you want to start. I, I think what I would do is that I, I would still, I would, I, think, shall we, I, I would fill it up a little bit more. Uh, probably just to start with and then adjust it accordingly. You want to remove the uh, parallax? So I typically yeah. always start middle of the pigtail because yeah, that's it, what I would do. you get used so to the predictability of how much it's going to dive in yeah. and you can correct for that as you're, as you're deploying that's the valve. Uh, okay. That's okay. okay. That's okay. All right. I think so. Uh, so, so we, that's, we will start opening it up a little now and we'll go. So the first one which the contact we do with the the tire, I, I sometimes uh, start pacing once it starts flowering and start pacing at around 130 once it's coming out of it. It's okay. I think it's okay. Just push so, on the wire a little bit. Okay, sir. So that's okay. No, so push, yeah, that's, that's the right okay. uh, position. So now we can push the valve in a little like bit as well. So it goes down because yeah. we are higher. We know that the picture yeah, is slightly higher. Yeah, keep in mind it's going to probably jump down yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So it has to adjust yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That's, that looks I good. I would think that it's okay. started so with high. So start pacing at 130. Okay, sir. Pacing start. And you can go faster here. So keep it there fast. The annual contact will also yeah. it's not so going fast over no, here. Go faster, but not we'll, yeah. we'll come to the and typically here I would take an injection 
just yeah. to see how deep we are because uh, you can now correct for it. Now at the rumble it. point, you can yes. stop pacing uh, now. Stop pacing. So flow so incrementally so decrease it. So we can see our hemodynamics there. Yeah, the it looks blood like pressure it's probably gone up. down. You can open it up a little bit more. Yeah, the blood pressure is so coming back up. Ji, uh, any comments from you guys? You have to read the... It I looks like it may have jumped a little bit more than expected. I don't know, it's difficult. Yeah, it looks yeah, a bit we'll, deep. Now we'll take a picture again. So, so we'll remove the parallax probably now and then we'll take the picture. So, uh, you want to just do it at the same view? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll remove the parallax of the valve actually. So let's go a little bit towards the uh, NEO side of it and then we'll see where we can remove the parallax of it. That's good. That's it. actually, okay, can you, okay, we'll do a dry city just to see probably I don't know whether the tilting position is still so that that's okay for the parallax. It's, it's a little bit deep for us. So we will recapture it and come back. So go back to the same yeah. ROV, view, please. It is a bit deep, but you don't have any paravalvular leak and you're you you do not have any rhythm issues. Yeah, so you know, so that's, that's the argument. Do you want us to recapture because the uh, you know the uh, rhythm is okay, QRS is not. Your happen. patient is so, stable, so your rhythm is fine. Anything will happen with that, but uh, I think I think yeah, they well, can, I think. at least they can try once more. Go, Maybe go they can uh, put a little bit higher. I would I, I would do I would yeah, a little bit yeah. deep than you know, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. So Omar Omar thinks that it, you can try again and and position it a little bit higher. We will do that. That's what we thought as well, but we were, we were thinking that's okay. So what you should do, you do is when you recapture the valve, don't move it because sometimes when you recapture the valve comes back on its own. So you can just start de-deploying it immediately. So just be cautious when you do this. Yeah. Because the bicuspid yeah. will yeah. jump. Do you have transthoracic echo as well on these cases? Yeah. Uh, transthoracic echo could you mean, sorry, did you say? Yeah, I guess it's, it's helpful. The to concern take, always uh, is that uh, the enemy of good is better. Uh, and so, in a bicuspid, so if you have no rhythm issues and so, no so PVL, we, you could argue that uh, that you just leave the valve where it is and don't recapture it. Yeah, with, but yeah, with bicuspid, you want to stay a little bit high anyway. So, this seems yeah, a little bit more than yeah, I would have. Uh, if you try several times and if you find the same result, I agree, I agree with you. Yeah. You can leave it. But, you know, at least one time. One time let's, you should yeah, definitely try it. And the patient is quite one stable. Time, one time more, yeah. The patient is stable, so yeah. it's. Uh, so, so, that's okay. They just wait there and then we'll see. I think I think uh, let's give a five mils a little bit. I'm going to conject. If anybody, you can inject. So, yes. so the starting position was at the bottom of the of the pigtail. So I yes. think that may be one of the reasons why they ended up a little bit. That's okay. Start that's okay. Start yeah. here. So uh, so this time we're going to start at this position again, and we'll place it around. 130 again. So I think maybe start, start at, at the mid of that uh, pigtail yeah. instead of starting at the lower end, because you're starting at the push same push place down, where you started down, before. Push down. Push down, sir. I think the challenge is to go Try slow to with these valves. Open it up faster. That's it. It's going down. No, this so is looking open it up. Yeah. Open it up. Uh, yeah. Rumble. It's a little bit higher. This is better, huh? Yeah. To get the pacing down. Yeah, stop. Uh, slip down the pacing a bit. Came down again. Keep it at uh, That's okay. Keep it at 60. Keep it at 60. The blood pressure is starting okay. to come up. Now switch it up. Pacing. Okay, so let's go to that view yeah, where this we looks lost better. the parallax again. And yeah. Really. Yeah. So, I, I don't know, do you guys believe in that when you remove the parallax towards the LED, it tends to be a bit deeper in any ways a little bit, so... Yeah, yeah it looks... We'll take a picture in this view, yeah. Uh, just a second. This is 5cc contrast direction, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's a... Can I go back to the... Are you again? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's still about, uh, I would say about six to eight millimeters, yeah. but a little bit better yeah. than yeah. before. I think I'm, I'm very inclined to open it there, but what do you guys think? Picture here. Because remember this, that it, you know, it doesn't, uh, it looks like a five, I guess. There. Yeah, in this view, it looks better actually, but it's, it's going to orient a little bit as well. It's it deeper on the left cusp so side, but as the valve shifts when you deploy it, that'll probably improve yeah, that depth we'll on the left this. side. So, this step we do it very slowly, so I pace over here as well. I don't know what you guys do. Do you guys pace at this point, or you guys don't pace at? I, I pace it around 110 to 20 or something. You should pace. You should pacing will be helpful. Yeah. 120, yeah. 
yeah. and move very slow. So this, this is the point where we go really that slow, probably, so. Very slow. Slow, yeah, very slow, one turn at time, probably, so. So typically we pace around 130 or 140, very slow release, so yeah, forward pressure on the delivery catheter, and we pull the LV you wire back. You can remove the pigtail. Yeah, I think we, we would have removed the pigtail. So, but I think the size is a big, so hopefully we won't have any issue. I, I don't, right. That's okay. Stop pacing now and stop, stop the flow. 90, 80, 70, okay. 60, and so, so what we do, we'll do is they probably remove uh, the nose cone now. So, uh, free it up and then come back and then we will deal with the pigtail later so go live please again and yeah pull the wire back i think the is pretty much free in any way, so. yeah and keep pulling back a bit so you didn't pull back on the wire normally you want to pull back at that time yes we did it that's true we, we did it but i think it was i didn't want catch to keep it the, the softer floor. portion at the uh, tip the most one is already free by then so the wire the movement can be very helpful to help finesse it at the end. Absolutely. What did you guys say? Was it just that last point? So you keep well pulling back a bit. We will come to the descending group and then we will reach. So we still need to come down a bit. Yeah. yeah. Keep pulling back a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. We will come to the descending and we will catch it here from grey to blue now. So, so do we have, uh, do we have uh, Dr. Tarkhani as well and uh, anyone from the US who, has, who does the new FX valve? Because I wanted to know about that one. We can. Uh, should we just let's. Uh, Yes, we are using the FX, and uh, it's excellent. You have markers to help you with the commissural alignment. Um, and then, of course, it's, uh, there's one more version that's being planned where you're going to have coronary uh, access uh, windows. But the FX has uh, been very kind because of those markers. And, of course, uh, I think we've had good results to help us with, with, with that additional floor of marker. I think the crossing profile of the FX is also improved compared to the W uh, because they've added another spine to it, so it's easier to cross in valve in valve compared to the previous iteration. Is it still a 14? Yeah, you have to be aware of the uh, side of port. Sometimes by changing it to 12 o'clock, uh, you, know, you can change the uh, the rigor of the vigor of the of the system, uh, as uh, Wasif was mentioning. It's very helpful. And also, uh, I think when you deploy these things, uh, you know, it's, it's position one and position two. Position one is crucial. Position two is doing all the action, but position one is also vital uh, to, to have that. So because we, we jump the pigtail, so we're going to use the wire to pull it out a bit, and there we go. So. And then put one of the pigtails and check the gradients as well, and then a parallel will leak, so probably as well. All right. Is the FX plus out or is it just the FX at the moment? FX. FX. So with a single spine, you know, you don't need to, I guess, place it in the middle of the yeah. thing. You position it where you want to deploy it and it's much more talkable. It's just a... Um, okay. So, yeah, we can exchange so it. Really the the can you show the gradients before as well? Or if you have that screen yeah. captured? Yeah. 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 Do you guys have routinely have echo in the room uh, for post assessment or, or just hemodynamics and, and angiography? Is, is there trans thoracic echo available uh, on the simultaneous or no? Yes. So, we will we'll do the echo for you guys in a bit, yes. With the patient's uh, CKD, it will be helpful just to assess with echo and make sure yeah, there's no significant. That. Yeah, I think without without yeah. doing the autogram would be a good yeah. idea yeah. just to look at the absolute. So your hemodynamics yeah, that's a good and idea. echo. Yeah. 
Yeah, just hemodynamics and the echo would be sufficient so to rule out severe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, we usually pause the cases, cases and look at echo periodically. One of the things that I have found very useful is to, before advancing the uh, the valve, is to actually assess the position of the safari wire with an echo and just uh, knowing that it's more towards the apex of the ventricle rather than stuck in somewhere in the middle or underneath the mitral valve apparatus. Because the one thing that I was a little uncomfortable during this was just the relationship of the catheter with the inner curvature rather than the greater curvature. Uh, and that might have something to do with the valve uh, position. And I think if you were higher up, there might have been a chance of moving it up further. I think you're deep enough that it didn't really move very much. But I think checking the wire position is usually will really help you adjust and push and pull and, and change the orientation of the catheter. Um, with the you're absolutely right. That's what I was trying to tell them, that this is a more horizontal one, so you're going to have to tighten up the um, the wire just a little bit so it goes in. Uh, so sometimes you have to push the wire in or pull it back in, depending on if it's sitting on the inner curvature or the outer curvature. So. And do you guys use a lentacus for these these types of anatomies, Dr. Thakali, or is it just always a... A curved up wire. Lundquist, uh, 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 I use it um, maybe <coughs> maybe once or twice uh, in fifty cases. <laughs> Oh, yeah, Lundquist is about five percent of cases. We have the Confida wire, but it does create a cost uh, issue. But that's a it's a good wire for us. So yeah, we, we use the Confida as well. I I, I was used during my uh, my oh, time in UK uh, at the Safari wire, but I found Confida as good as that, actually. I, I didn't find any difference in using uh, Confida. Yeah, the lender quest I found very useful for the tortuosity in aorta. I mean, when we started yes. doing this um, way back when, it, the only cases we could do was prohibitive cases. There were absolutely no way they could have surgery. Exactly. So I remember putting in uh, three lender quests to straighten out an aorta. Uh, from yeah. And so it's just crazy things that we, uh, we don't do those anymore because our numbers are watched very carefully. So we're actually we're that's the that cases which are very high risk that we started off with. Yeah. I, I when, you're pushing the, when you're pushing the catheter in with the valve, the key is somebody who's holding the wire to really watch that wire. It migrates to the apex. This is the time where you run into trouble, especially when you have the uh, elder small females you're going to perforate and create an effusion issue. So that wire needs to keep coming back just a little bit as you're pushing the system in. I think everybody is focused on the actual valve, but the wire gets missed in the translation. Exactly. Even while I don't know why, over the years I have experienced it, even while doing it uh, to the um, pigtail, it's the mid cavity is a good area for it, I think. So you are very glad that in a small female, it can cause problems. Oh, it's a zero gradient. So um, we're going to repeat them at the moment. So I don't know if you guys can see it on the screen yeah. there. Yeah, we can see that there's and there's good separation between the diastolic pressures Excellent. that rules so out. Yeah. 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 The pulse pressure is not that wide and diastolic. Yeah. So the hemodynamics don't suggest there'll be a significant yeah. AI, but uh, can you get an echo in to show them? Okay. So we are any other respect function. So uh, we'll verify on echo as well, but We'll yeah, you it, can uh, show us the echo and then we probably have to leave, uh, I think, uh, looks great. So, Dr. Omar, any other precautions you would uh, for a bicuspid valve as compared to tricuspid when you're doing a bicuspid? I think the most important part is sizing and uh, classification. Cardiac mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, post orientation. Does it matter? Is it uh, Sievert 0, 1, or 2? Um, th that uh, classification, like 2 cusps, or doesn't really matter? I, I don't, think, yeah, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. So, um, so I think because. I think we, we because as, as I, I don't know whether um, anyone has mentioned about the registry which we, uh, we are going to start probably to uh, record these uh, patients now and uh, I think it's it's going to be on the Pakistan level uh, led by 
our uh, top people like Bashir Naik, Dr. Nadeem Bazwi Saab, and Dr. Asad Patan Zawan, uh, uh, and I think that's going to help us because I think that we, in my experience, there are seventy percent of the cases are bicuspid, and I think we can contribute to the knowledge of this bicuspid more than from outside of the Asian okay. population. Just on the echo over here, so you know. Um, this is a limit echo on this, we don't know, yeah. So not seeing much AI over there, can, can you uh, do short access as well? And also then... Yeah, so we're seeing at the echo and there's not much AI over there, so... Uh, Trivial, if anything, and that probably wants to, uh, yeah. And that uh, probably yeah. is okay with the human dynamics, so... Move Were you guys so. able to maintain rhythm? Was there a good uh, PR interval? And Na narrow QRS, narrow? yeah, and yeah, this excellent. is remain in sinus throughout, no rhythm issues. Um, yeah, so I think that we are... No, if you didn't, then, yeah. probably go towards the closures now. Yeah, no. Very nicely done. Very nicely done. Well done. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Well done. <laughs> great think, case. Great case. Thank you so yeah. much. I think. Well uh, done. Very nice. So are you still done. excellent yeah, are you going to Sign up so, for. Yeah, we'll we'll try to join you guys for the rest of the discussions yeah. there in a bit. So we'll finish here and <coughs> come to the hall there. So we'll see yeah. you guys in a bit. I think we'll have to move on. Thank you so much. 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 To Barry, our team, you know, and all of you. And it's uh, a team work as, uh, as you know, so. Uh, uh, and Dr. Ramiz. Yeah, so very nice to this. You need to have a good public anesthesiologist, and she's always been a great support for us here as well, Dr. Ramiza. And um, so, uh, in terms of the vascular excess, you know, we always use, and it should be, uh, you know, some be, somebody mentioned we almost use <laughs> ultrasound for vascular excess, but it's, I think it should be 100% because we, I don't know if you have the image, 12 o'clock position excess, and uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, when you're doing pre close, it's, uh, you want to get it uh, uh, right there. So, all right, so, so I guess. Do, I know. do you have. Thank so you very is, much, everyone. So, is Ali Reza back there? Is Ali Reza with yeah. you? Yes, he's I'm still, there. still there. I haven't left. Ali, uh, since you were the proctor, what are your comments on this uh, case? Why don't you give us a, a, a minute of uh, what your thoughts were? I think that because, because the barrier has taken off very well at the moment. So the case, for me, the bicuspid, and we selected the bicuspid especially for the discussion purposes. And we, uh, the case went all very well. Although we did a little bit more for the conference, I think we had a bit of an issue in crossing the valve. And probably we might have not used the a temporary wire and few things in our routine practices, uh, we, we avoid those things. But yeah, the, the case was all all okay and it all went very well. What, what The TAVI, I think we need to promote it a lot in Pakistan and there's still a lot of vacuum and I hope inshallah in future uh, it will be good under the guidance of all our uh, the, so, the, Ali, seniors I think who started used, it very bad. What catheter you use after AL1? Uh, I think you used a JR or what, which catheter was JR, that? So JR, okay. I use a JR guide and actually I, I use the, the JR guide for crossing yeah, the Yeah, you see that's what it's Dr. Omar Goptikin was mentioning earlier that he always use a, even AL guide instead of the diagnostic catheter because you have more support for exactly. that. Yeah. Uh, and there is usually a wood a wood I think oh, anyone knows about the water guide. That's that's a combination of JL and a EBU, and that's really good in crossing. I used it a lot in UK. Uh, so the, I'm going to use AL one, but then I change it according to the napkin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I was going to also point out Ali Raza. Thank you so much. Um, I call him my guru now because he's done a five basilica. Uh, recently that uh, I've not had the opportunity of, so I'm not uh, I, so I, I, I wanted to plug that in for him. <laughs> I will take that with him. Dr. Dr. Farkad, uh, 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 Ali, thank you so much for a great case. Uh, very well done and, you know, good good learning points from it. Thank you all. Thank you very much. So we'll go back to our uh, live inbox case. Yeah, thank you. So, Hashim, could you show us the case?